All right, family, I am trying to make sure that we are good to go here. Let me see. Um, hey, I'm David Collins, like the thing says. Um, I'm the pastor of New Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church, so uh, we've been struggling with our software this morning, and uh, I figured I might as well go ahead and do what we could instead of sitting around feeling frustrated about what we can't. So um, we got our Facebook um, live stream working. If you normally watch on YouTube, hey, welcome to Facebook. Stay a while. It's nice. And um, we will get this up to uh, YouTube a little bit later today. So um, we want to go ahead and get you uh, get you the message this this uh, this morning. I'm a little out of sorts. Y'all pray for me. I'm going to pray. I'm going to be all right. And uh, if you could let me know if you can hear me okay. Just let me know if you can hear me. And I'm just trying to get everything straight here. I hadn't done a live stream on Facebook in a long time. So let me see. All right. All righty. I'm trying to give y'all just a minute so I can make sure everything is working. I know Ash is down there doing her thing. If you're on, can you just let me know if the sound is okay? So I know to get going. And I'm keeping an eye on the chat for Facebook. Mm hmm. If anybody is in the chat, just verify for me before I start talking. I don't want to be. Uh... Let me see. This is different. Check with Ashley, y'all. We're, we're doing this um this 2023 thing, man. Can you hear all right? I guess I could check on my phone. I'll be talking to myself, it'd be a weird echo thing, but what you think? Okay, it is working. Good. Okay. So, um, Let's get into the message today. Uh, I don't have the slides and all this kind of all the all my little nice stuff that I normally do, but I will be able to look over and see your comments, your questions in the chat. So I got all the um, I've got all of the uh, information about the lesson today uh, already populated in the description of this video, and um, let's do this. All right, Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this time to come together. And learn about you, Father. Hear your word to understand, Father, what you what you would have us to know about you, what you want us to know about uh, about how to conduct ourselves, God. I, we, Lord, we just love you. We thank you. We honor you. We praise you, Lord Jesus. God, help me in this moment to get myself out of the way. Let the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Lord, you are my strength. You are my redeemer. I can't do it without you, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So, Lord, I just thank you. I thank you, Lord. I honor you and praise you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen and amen. So, um, again, we are uh, we're finishing up our January series on what the Bible doesn't say. And I have been loving every minute of it. I, am, I love this series every year. We're going to do it. Every year, as long as I'm around uh, at New Mount Zion, Amen. Okay, thank you, Ashley. Bless you. So, uh, if you are t if you're in the if you're in the chat, I probably can't hear you. But I'm trying to see if I can fix that. Let's see. I probably can't see your messages, but that's okay. Let me see here. Let's turn that down and see if I can see. Okay, good. That's a that's a good backup over there. All right. That'll be a good backup so I can make sure the stream is up. Okay, so let's go ahead and turn in our Bibles. Go ahead and get in your Bibles to John 4, uh, John chapter 4, as I give us the, the setup for this lesson. Uh, just like we've done all month, it is important for us to understand how many of the things that we say often, things that we get used to saying about God or believe about the Bible, how many of those things actually are not in the Bible? 
it's a trip how often that happens. So my hope today is that we can uh, finish strong with this series. We've been focused a whole lot on uh, the word of faith movement and the uh, prosperity gospel and trying to decipher how much of that is uh, true to the word of God. And you're probably finding like I am, not that much. Um, but it's, it is a very popular movement that's going on, especially in America, but spread all around the world. And there are a whole lot of things that we have heard, whether it's about money, where it's about our ability to speak things into existence. Um, if you've been around for the last uh, for the last month, you can let folks know that we've been talking about some deep stuff. So today we are um, we're going to talk about something that I am used to hearing in church, and you probably are too. And even if you don't go to, uh, even if you're not in church or your church doesn't do this, you probably hear it if you listen to live worship music. Um, you're probably used to hearing in the beginning of the of the song the uh, whoever's leading the song will say something like everybody just calm your minds don't think right now just close your eyes you know it, clear your minds and just it's just you and god and just just worship just worship y'all y'all ever heard that i know i'm not the only person who's uh, who's been encouraged when they go to church to just worship. What does that mean? You know, I, I hear it in the beginning of a lot of gospel songs. It sounds like a really nice, uh, you know, uh, emotional appeal. Just worship. Just, just, just worship. As if there is, it's possible to do something else or that I shouldn't be thinking while I'm worshiping or that I should be doing something different than what I'm doing. Just worship. So I want to talk about that today. I want to talk about that kind of idea, uh, where it came from and what it means, what the dangers are of somebody uh, thinking that the way that they ought to experience God is through just worship. Don't think. All bets off, just worship. Now, what I'm gonna, I want to say this all the way up front. I am not trying to tell you how or how not to worship. That's not my, that's not my goal. I want to give you some biblical truth about how Jesus describes worship so that we can worship God as the text is going to tell us in spirit and in truth. Y'all got your finger in John 4? All right. So let me, uh, let's talk about how we got here that's where i really want to say um at the beginning of a lot of churches today you'll usually find a band and some musicians maybe a group of singers sometimes they, they designate these folks as the praise and worship team i want you to just get go in your mind here with me because i know i've done this a million times there's usually a, a slow repetitive song that's really emotional and it has it, it can kind of lull you into this kind of trance like state right and it's like and usually you can feel like something significant is happening because people are beginning to worship uh, and, and maybe the person who's at the microphone whether it's the, the the praise team leader or the music minister or maybe the worship pastor starts to starts to talk to you and give you some some guidance about how you deal with these emotions as you just worship and they might say things like, uh, this is a moment of breakthrough, or the spirit of the Lord is here, or, you know, this is the time when the spirit is high, or we ought to pray that the Holy Spirit would fall on this place. You heard stuff like that? They, they use, even in this, sometimes they give you some very generalized uh, prophecy, you know, that sounds like something that's mostly just a word of affirmation. Somebody's having a hard day today and somebody needs to know that God is still God while this music is droning around you and giving you this sense of euphoria. Um, at the, so if you've been in churches like I have been, uh, sometimes that music continues on and the atmosphere intensifies and it's like anything can happen. Uh, people will have their hands in the air. Sometimes they sway to the music. Sometimes people... Uh, sing, some of them cry out aloud, some of them even call out in tongues. 
start speaking other languages. Y'all ever been there? But it's cool because the goal is just to worship. I've been to some churches where, uh, where maybe that's all it is, but I've seen other places where people will be dancing around and jumping up and down or doing their, doing their, their two-step or doing the chicken wing or doing whatever they do to get their praise and worship on. Sometimes they call it, in the Pentecostal church, they call it shouting, even though it's not shouting, it's actually dancing. But people call it shouting, right? That you, are, that you completely lose control of your body and the Holy Spirit takes over, question mark? Now, sometimes in church, when they, when you when this moment comes, one of the ministers or maybe the pastor goes around and and touches people on the head and they uh, are slain in the spirit. A phrase that's not found in the Bible. Thing, a, a phenomenon that's not found in the Bible. But they just worship him. Um. So when someone speaks up and says, "People rolling around on the floor and screaming." and losing control of their bodies more closely resembles demon possession than it does Jesus worship. Usually what you'll hear from somebody who's doing that is, you can't tell me how to worship. My worship is different than your worship. I do it differently. This is a thing between me and God. And I wondered as I was preparing you know, and I've been thinking about this for a long time because I've been a musician in church for most of my life. From like 16 on, I started playing in church. Uh, and I was trying to figure out what's happening here and how did we get to this point? Because as much as there seems to be about a script to how this worship goes, I couldn't find that script in the Bible. And that's where we ought to be getting our theology and our guidance. So I looked at this phenomenon. Where did we get this idea that literally anything could be worship? That literally anything could be worship. You go to the, uh, if you look at things like the Toronto, uh, the Toronto meetings or the Lakeland revival that happened in Florida or what's go what happened in Tulsa, Oklahoma, People would be rolling around on the floor, screaming like they were burning. I've heard pastors who got up and or preachers who got up and said, you may feel like electricity is running all through your body. I've seen people shaking and laughing uncontrollably, barking like dogs or howling like wolves. But it's just worship. Who am I to judge how they connect to God? Because they just worship it. My question is always going to come back to, why are you doing what you're doing? And who is being worshipped? Let's talk about it a little bit. How do we, and this is an American phenomenon, if you live anywhere else in the world, uh, I'm sorry that we have outsourced this, that we have exported this thing to where you are, because we definitely have. But I want you to know that the, 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 the idea of just worshipping, just doing whatever you feel, is not by happenstance. Um, it is a it is the result of a movement that happened in the early 1900s. Uh, but and there was a couple of people who were instrumental in this movement. And I want to give you a little history before I give you some scripture and leave you alone for today. Is that all right? There's a man named Charles Fox Parham who was born in the uh, mid to late 18 uh, 1800s. Charles Fox Parham was a Methodist minister and uh, he was he you know he went through his, his Bible college and all that and as he was preaching he became less interested in teaching the gospel and more interested in uh, what he called holiness and the signs the spiritual gifts specifically speaking in tongues Charles Fox Parham got to the point that his uh, contemporaries, the people who were preaching with and around him, uh, were kind of ostracizing him because it seemed like he was getting away from the scripture as the basis for his teaching. Good morning, Sister Diane. Hey, Mon. Uh, 
Hey, Sister Carol. Oh, man. TC in the building. What's going on, Rod? Love y'all, man. Just giving you a little history before so we understand why we do what we do. Uh, remember, everything that we do for God matters, and I think you ought to be, in, you, you should be informed. So Charles Fox Parham, this Methodist minister who uh, it gets is less interested in doing what the Bible says and is not satisfied with normal worship. To this point, you know, worship, except in some place, I mean, some people were running around holding snakes and stuff like that. But for the most part, the, the common Christian church might be singing hymns, doing some prayer. Uh, they might have someone lead a song or a choir sing. They might have a testimony. Usually somebody get up and preach. And that's about it. You know, that's what they expected. If something else happened, it was out of the ordinary. Uh, because the goal, as Jesus told, told the disciples way back, was to preach him crucified, raised from the dead, so that people could be saved. Charles Fox Parham wasn't satisfied with just that, though. And the more people pushed him away, the more radical he became. And he began to focus. He even opened his own Bible school, a Bible college, and he said that he could teach people, and I think I've got, I don't have my slide up, but let me, I can, I'll give you the quote here, just one second. Uh, Charles Fox Parham believed, so if you've ever heard this, I want you to know where this is coming from. He believed that there was a second baptism of the Holy Spirit that everybody needed to have. Anybody ever heard that? Okay, yeah, you're saved, but have you been baptized in the Holy Ghost? That started with Charles Fox Parham. That idea had been floating around, but he made it real mainstream. This is a quote from him. The anointing of the Holy Spirit is given to illuminate his word, to open the scriptures, and to place the spiritual man in direct communication with the mind of God. So Charles Fox Parham said, you, you, you can be saved, but that doesn't mean you, you, you really know. You can be saved, but you might not be supercharged quite yet. You can be saved, but you're not anointed of the Holy Ghost. You can be saved, but you're only kind of halfway powerful because you don't have all that is necessary. Charles Fox Parham. Now, now, now so, so, so Charles, if I'm not really activated in the Holy Spirit and I need that second baptism, how am I going to get it? Well, of course he knew he was going to give it to you. He'd show you how to do it. He could lay hands on you. He could give you the mantle. He could put it. He, he could impart this to you. Charles kind of elected himself, named himself, designated himself as the person who could dispense the Holy Spirit. And his meetings got really, really exciting the more he did this. Uh, and Parham was really, now he really was excited about missionary work. Uh, and he thought that he wanted, now even though Paul says in the end of 1 Corinthians 12 that not everybody prophesies, not everybody's an apostle, not everybody works miracles, not everyone speaks in foreign languages, not everyone discerns foreign languages. Parham still believed that everybody should speak in other languages. So he had his missionaries come out and he said, if you've never spoken in foreign languages, I'm going to give you that gift and you'll be able to do it. So in his school for the first couple of years, people were just swearing up and down. They were speaking Chinese and Greek and Hebrew and Japanese and, 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 and Farsi, all these other languages. What's interesting is nobody in the room spoke none of them languages. They didn't have a way to verify that uh, that anybody was actually speaking those languages. They had a lot of stories, but it wasn't like someone who spoke the language natively could come in and tell them what they were speaking. Parham told him, don't worry, you are preaching the word of God. And so he sent some missionaries out to places like India and Japan and China. And he was fully convinced that they would go over there and they could share Jesus with people in these nations. So they went over there and spoke those those tongues. Shalahando, scuba de boba, shando shilikasalala de boba. And these Japanese 
and Chinese and Indian people looked at them like they were crazy. <laughs> the translators that they had with them said, you haven't said anything in our language. Is this really what you came here to do? The missionaries came back to Charles Parham deflated, defeated, despondent. You told us we were speaking other languages. What gives? So Parham was faced with a, with a quandary, with an issue. I can either say, uh oh, this was all a fake. We had some ex emotional experiences, but clearly it's not what tongues look like in Acts chapter two. You know, in Acts chapter two, all the, pe the two people were sitting together and they were uh, praying and the Holy Spirit came down and rested on them in like tongues of fire. And everyone started to speak in other languages. And there was people from half a dozen other places in different languages who was in Jerusalem. And everybody heard the gospel being preached in their own language. They didn't hear Shabba They heard in their own languages, God is good. His son Jesus died for your sins. It was a miracle. So Charles Parham is sitting here thinking, uh, what do I tell these people now? So he made a shift in his theology. I want you to follow this. You can't tell me how to worship. Listen. So Charles Parham began to teach his students, oh, we misunderstood. What we thought were missionary tongues were actually a, see if you've ever heard this, private prayer language that you and God have. It, it, you're speaking a heavenly language. Because, you know, in 1 Corinthians 13, it says, if I speak in the languages of men and angels, but if I don't have love, I'm just a sounding gong or a clanging cymbal. I'm nothing. So he says, that's what that's talking about. You're speaking that heavenly language that Paul is suggesting might exist. So when he stepped away from wanting this gift to have anything to do with sharing, sharing Jesus, all bets were off. Suddenly, when they untethered themselves from the Bible as the source of truth, anything could be worshiped. Absolutely anything. And he, and he got more and more students to come in and their manifestations of the spirit became uh, stronger and stranger. He would say that he touched somebody once and a golden halo formed over her head. And she was able to prophesy because he had imparted the Holy Spirit to her. They talked about feeling what felt like electricity running through their bodies, feeling overwhelmed and overcome. Parham still was kind of keeping folks reined in. Uh, he taught this in his own Bible college. Um, did I mention that Parham is a KKK, Ku Klux Klan sympathizer? Out, out in uh, overt racist? So one of his students, uh, I say his students, his name was a, he's a black man named William Seymour. He wasn't allowed to sit in the classes because he was black. Uh, so he was, but he was allowed to sit outside of the classes. He was, he was able to sit outside and listen. And even though William Seymour was not allowed to sit inside because of his race, he was still captivated with this new emphasis on what they called holiness and strange signs. So William Seymour left Topeka, Kansas, and he went to Los Angeles and began to preach down there in this neighborhood and when he first went to preach, he went to someone else's church. They asked him to come and speak. And he started preaching about these personal prayer languages and about all these other ecstatic forms of worship that were not found in the Bible. And the pastor and the preachers told him, get out and don't come back. So William Seymour started doing some house church work. And among those, and it was on this place called Azusa Street. And while William Seymour is at this house, he said that as he had been, you know, praying all night long and preparing himself, he began to, he got the gift. He received the gift from the Holy Spirit to speak in tongues. He began to speak in this gibberish, this language that nobody could understand. And then other people saw him do it. And he told them that they could do it also. 
So they started speaking in these tongues. All of a sudden tongues, which in the Bible is just another word for languages. It, it's not its own language, but little by little, William Seymour, with the help of, of Charles Fox Parham, had redefined tongues now. And they decided that I don't need the Bible to tell me how to worship. And within days, William Seymour was a celebrity on Azusa Street. People were coming from all around to be a part of his worship. And I mean, they got wild. People began to, uh, it, it, some people compared it to group hypnosis. Charles Fox Parham in, uh, in Looking Back said, one of the people that William, uh, that, that William Seymour had with him was a hypnotist. <laughs> one of the ministers there. The worship got unhinged and you had a Pentecostal revolution rolling because they still said that this was the same Holy Spirit who was, Teach, who gave the disciples the ability to speak in other languages in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. People again started doing things like rolling around on the floor, screaming out in pain, saying they were getting baptized by the Holy Spirit in fire, making animal sounds. They'd be repeating Jesus' name over and over and foaming at the mouth, laughing hysterically, and of course, speaking in tongues. They were... I mean, they had all kinds of claims in this Azusa Street revival. There was, they said there were angelic vis visitations, golden halos on people. Uh, there were uh, uh, healings that went from fixing your headache to giving you a, a new leg after you had it amputated. The, the problem is all of these claims were either, either proven to be false or they were deemed unlikely and without any medical confirmation but people didn't let a little thing like the facts keep them from worshiping. The nights got longer and stranger and worshipers were free to express themselves however they pleased. They would describe some people as going into prophetic trances, saying that they were hearing God's voice or angels and music began to be part of this movement. You, you get where I'm going here? The meetings were not distinguishable eventually from a Hindu Kundalini ritual or a Buddhist meditation or any number of pagan practices. Christians are not the only ones that speak in this ecstatic language. So people started to raise concerns, but they got rebuked, called not spiritual, saying they lacked faith. Nowadays, they probably call you a Pharisee. <laughs> so. Charles Fox Parham heard about all this going on and he was really, really worried. Remember his thing was just speaking in these missionary languages and he had let one lie turn into a whole theology that had thousands of people flocking to Azusa Street to be a part of this revival. When Parham got there, he was horrified. He wrote about it, in a, in a, there's a book about him, and he was interviewed many, many times, and he was disgusted at what he saw. Charles Parham was, uh, was a racist, and one of the things that disgusted him the most is he saw a white woman fall into the arms of a black man under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Can't believe, because a big part of Azusa Street was races were mixing as well. People from the black, white, and, and Hispanic especially were all worshiping together, which to that point had been pretty taboo, in some places illegal. Parham went there and he couldn't believe that people were in a room, that there'd be hundreds of people who were just screaming and shouting in some other language. He, he said it looked more like demon worship to him, that it looked like there was some other spirit that had overtaken the place. And when Parham tried to speak up, it proved impossible because nobody wanted to hear him anymore. He had started this thing and it had grown into its own movement without him. Couldn't really deal with William Seymour. He was so uh, caught up in the movement that it was hours and hours a day 
that people would be singing and shouting and screaming and speaking in tongues. And it got so loud and so it got so, so overwhelming that sometimes William Seymour would sit in the corner with a box over his head, hands over his ears to keep the noise out. And then he'd get up and prophesy for a while and then go back. From this revival come denominations like the Church of God in Christ. Kojic came from the Azusa Street Revival, from this Pentecostal revolution. This wasn't just a thing that happened over a weekend. This went on for about eight years of meetings. Eight years of meetings. The Church of God in Christ came out. If you're a church, if you are or have been in a Church of God in Christ, you have heard them say, "I'm, uh, I'm." I'm water baptized, I'm Holy Ghost filled, and I am filled with the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And that's where that comes from. From a lying racist minister and one of his students who got caught up in this movement. Church of God in Christ came from this movement, as did the Assemblies of God denomination. The only big difference was the Church of God in Christ was mostly black. The Assemblies of God was mostly white. But they had really similar theology. And they are really responsible. And this Azusa Street Revival that began in the, around 1901, 1906, uh, has turned into this entire idea of no holes barred worship. That the more excited you are, that the more out of control you are, that the more... Uh, unhinged you get, the more your faith is proven, the more spiritual you must be. And if you just sat back and wanted to hear preaching, you were boring. You know, musicians caught on quickly as this began to spread throughout the U.S. And they brought the, the music from blues and jazz and rock into the church. And I can tell you as a musician that it is a formulaic thing. You can figure out how, what chords and what tempos and what beats make people excited. Ministers quickly learned that those trance-like states, these worship extravaganzas, these revivals, drew people in droves to come to their churches. And it wasn't long before the prosperity pimps jumped in and realized that if you got people into a mass hysteria where they would ignore the racial lines and they would uh, forego any kind of decorum, that you could probably get them to give you money. Anybody ever been to church and you're feeling emotional? Maybe a song is going well. Maybe it's after the sermon and someone says, now in the spirit of this moment, God is in this place and this is your time to sow into this moment. Your most, the best worship you can give God right now is money. Worship. You can worship by giving me money. Because <laughs> worship was whatever we wanted it to be. Now, in all of this history I've given you, has anybody noticed what's missing? From all of this talk about tongues and angels and halos and spirits and manifestations and the spirit coming in like a cloud and leg lengthening and all this stuff, what, what are we missing? It's, we haven't talked about the gospel yet. The reason that I haven't brought up the gospel yet is because that was not a focus of Charles Fox Parham. I hear you, man. We hadn't talked about scripture yet because scripture went out the window in 1901. We haven't talked about Jesus. When worship became this thing that I experienced, not something that I am shackled to the Bible about, Anything goes. In Azusa Street, a lot of times it was the same people who were going to these meetings to roll around in fits. They'd come in just fine. Maybe somebody would cast a demon out of them on Monday night. And by Tuesday afternoon, I guess the demon was back because they needed to cast out again on Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday. The Azusa Street Revival 
was not focused on evangelism or preaching the word of God at all. It was on people who already expected to have an experience getting their shout on, getting their dance on, experiencing the fullness of the Holy Spirit in any way they wanted to. But the problem is when worship is more about experience than it is about scripture, anything can be worship. As a musician, I'm trying to tell you, I know how to play things on a saxophone that would make you feel sad, happy, overwhelmed, emotional. I just do. If you're a musician, you know too. Ashley and I once went, I mean, have you seen um, Beyonce concerts? Michael Jackson, who y'all like now? BTS. Where there'll be girls who are just screaming, passing out, jumping up and down, and shouting and shaking. Are they worshiping? Ashley and I went to a Kamasi Washington concert. He's an amazing jazz saxophone player. Had a big band and a lady who was singing and dancing over on the side. It was kind of weird at first, but we got into it and it was so nice. And by the end of the concert, she was just saying, I am here over and over and over. Ashley and I look at each other and we're both crying. <laughs> like, Why am I crying? This is so good. Was that worship? Well, obviously not. We weren't worshiping God. We were saved. We were just emotional because the moment had stirred up our feelings. The whole concept of worship can blur when it's just whatever you want it to be. When the pandemic came, that was a big turning point for me. You know, I was a musician who played in church and I remembered that the best services were the ones where people were excited, where you left tired, where people danced and shouted and fell out on the floor and were crying and, and and it was completely out of control. But I look back on those days and I wonder, did anybody get saved? Because a lot of times people would come in nasty. They would show out for a few hours and they'd be cussing folks out by the time they got to their car. <laughs> they had this encounter with the Lord in his fullness. And couldn't wait till next week to do it all over again. So I started wondering what worship really is. Does God have permission to tell you how to worship? Does he? When the pandemic hit, I realized that all the things that I associated with worship were more associated with creating a musical, theatrical, emotional environment that made people more likely to act like they didn't care what was going on. To get people to, uh, to show you some expression of emotion. But when, we were, when I was preaching from home during the pandemic, I realized that a lot of that stuff was a distraction. Because when it was just me and the word of God, and my charge was still to worship God and to give the word to the people, I quickly had to make a decision. Do we do this at the building and hire singers and musicians to make sure that we can replicate this environment? We got to get this thing like Azusa Street. Or was it possible that I was off and that we could go back to doing it the way they said in the Bible? Well, as you can see, I don't have a band behind me. <laughs> but what's, what's more important is that we do understand what we are doing. Not everything, the Bible never gives us license to do whatever we feel and call it worship. It doesn't. I'm going to, um, man, I wish I could put my logos on the screen but i can't i don't think i can do that i don't want to mess things up i hadn't messed with um let me see maybe i can i hadn't done this on facebook much so let me see if i can uh, but i want you to um we're gonna go to john chapter four john chapter four and i want us to see what jesus the supposed object of our worship says about how worship should look. 
Let me see. Oh man, if y'all pray for me, y'all. No, I don't know how to do it. Okay. So y'all just have to you know, work with me and if you need these notes i can send them to you all right so um there we go so in john 4 we find jesus who is traveling from south in judea back to his home in galilee but between judea and galilee is this area called samaria samarians were not friends of the uh of the Jews. They were sort of related. They were kind of cousins. Uh, Mon said, send them to me. I will, Mon. I got you. Um, the Samaritans were cousins of the Jews. You remember we talked about it last year as we were doing our series on um, finding Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. And we went through the minor prophets. If you sat with us, you know that there was a time when uh, David's grandson, Solomon's son, Rehoboam, uh, really just jacked up the job as king and caused a lot of division and 10 of the tribes went north and they headquartered themselves in Samaria. And they worshiped it. They, they began to worship other gods and mix in idol worship with temple worship. They made their own, they'd start making up their own rules. And as payment for the, and they also discarded the poor. They uh, took advantage of those who were poor. They traded uh, unequally and God was angry with them. And after warning them over and over, God allowed the city to be taken by the Assyrians. And almost no one was left who was a member of the tribes of Israel. There were a few. So there were 70 years that the, uh, that the northern Israelites were in captivity. Well, when the ones who survived, the few who survived, they returned, they came back to a place that was inhabited. They'd been gone 70 years. So what they did is they mixed in with the people. They intermarried and they began to try to figure out how they could still acknowledge God without rocking the boat too much. How they could synthesize their worship with the people of the area. So the Assyrians uh, left and the people started it. We see this in 2 Kings 7, uh, 2 Kings 17, that the only part of Jewish worship that they kept was reading the Pentateuch. That's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They threw out the rest of the, they, they didn't want to hear the prophets, they didn't want to hear the history books. They just wanted enough that they could say that they were worshiping Yahweh. As you can imagine, without all that history, without all that prophecy, kind of like the Azusa Street revivals, they descended into religious confusion. The most prominent thing about the Samaritans and their religion was that they really didn't know. They didn't have anything for sure. It's almost like Solomon knew what he was talking about in Proverbs 29 and 18 says, without prophetic revelation, people run wild, but, but one who follows divine instruction will be happy. Maybe that's another one that people said, without vision, the people perish mistranslation without prophetic vision the people run wild perish okay but the second part of that verse is but one who follows divine instruction will be happy the jews of the southern kingdom resented the samaritans they didn't like that even after they themselves went through the babylonian captivity and made it back so samaritans the samaritans and the jews were beefing like hatfields and mccoys and when someone, when Jews traveled between Galilee and Judea, instead of going straight through Samaria, Samaria, they would go all the way around to avoid these Samaritans. But Jesus says in the beginning of uh, John 4 that it was necessary that they go through Samaria. And he has this beautiful conversation with a woman who is at the well. She uh, shouldn't be there at that time. It's strange for her to be alone. And you have this Jewish, that's weird, male, that's weirder, rabbi speaking to this Gentile woman who's a Samaritan. And as they talk, the woman is shocked that Jesus wants to talk to her. She, he explains to her, 
you know, if you give me a drink, she says, why would you ask me for a drink? You're a Jew. And he asked, remember, he says, you know, if you, uh, that I give you a drink of some living water and you'll never thirst again. She said, man, let me have some of that. He says, go get your husband. She says, no, I, I, I don't have a husband. He's all right. You're right. You've had five. And the one you're with is not your husband. And she said, wow, I can tell you're a prophet. That in mind, we pick up at verse 19. Jesus has proven that he has some kind of uh, divine authority, some kind of power. And she thinks he's a prophet. They did have the Old, the old Testament, so they knew that in Deuteronomy um, that a prophet was someone who spoke truthfully. They knew that... Uh, they knew they knew at least that much. So they uh, so she asked. Let me uh, see if I want to read it. She was worried <laughs> and missed out on the wall. Hey, that's good. I'm just trying to make sure I got everything here. It's Deuteronomy 18 that talks about uh, who you should believe and who you shouldn't believe. It talks about if someone prophesies falsely, don't believe them. If they say the word said it and that doesn't happen, if they say God told me and it's proven to be false, don't listen to them, actually kill them. So even though they only had the first five books of the Bible, they, they had enough to know that a prophet was somebody who spoke truthfully. So she says, I see that you're a prophet in verse 19. It says in verse 20, our ancestors, the Samaritan, worshipped on this mountain, and that's Mount Gerizim, which is weird. Remember, they didn't know what they were doing. The reason they worshipped on Mount Gerizim was that they believed that's where Moses worshipped God and got the Ten Commandments. But we know that was on Mount Sinai. But they were convinced it was Gerizim, so they built a temple there. That's why she's asking Jesus this question. She says, our ancestors, our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you Jews say that the place to worship is in Jerusalem. And so she gave Jesus a multiple choice question. Can you pick A or B? You speak for God. You hear his voice. Tell us where we should be worshiping. Are we doing it right or are they doing it right? Jesus says in verse 21, Believe me, woman, an hour is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain, nor in Jerusalem. The people had gotten so territorial, they had gotten so adversarial about their worship, that they were more about me being right compared to that person. You know I'm a guy who likes to look at definitions, and I looked up the definition of worship, uh, the word that Jesus used in Greek here, and it is the activities of a person that show their devotion to a deity. It doesn't necessarily have anything to do with being in a temple or being in a ceremony or being in a rite or being in a service. Worship is whatever you do that proves to someone who's looking at you that you are devoted to God. So let's go back and see what she says, because it kind of sounds silly when you think about it that way. The woman said, I see you're a prophet. Our ancestors proved that they were devoted to this unknown God on Mount Gerizim. You Jews say that you prove that you believe in God in Jerusalem. And Jesus says, believe me, woman, an hour is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Remember in Jerusalem, they had a temple where there were sacrifices that went on. In the Old Testament system, there was a designated place where people were supposed to come to make sacrifices, especially on the Day of Atonement. We get that in Leviticus 16, where the high priest would put a spotless lamb on the altar, shed its blood for the people for the remission of their sins. And for a year, they were good. They had been forgiven, but it had to be done every single year. So Jesus tells her, now that you know that I'm speaking for God, I need you to understand that your question is off. 
the question is not whether you worship in a Kojic church or assemblies of God. It's not even in how you do what you do specifically, but it's that you, verse 22, he says, you Samaritans worship what you do not know. Remember, they had this mixed up religion that was however much of God they wanted, which was very little, and a whole lot of the world, and they just did what felt right. He said, you Samaritans worship what you don't know, but we worship what we do know, because salvation is from the Jews. Jesus points out to her that you don't even know who's on the other side of your divine activities. You have pushed away any sort of discipline or tradition so far that you're up there doing whatever feels right, not even being concerned about who's on the other end. But he said the Jews, for all their faults and their flaws and their failings, they had maintained the law and the prophets of the history books, the Proverbs, the Psalms, and taught their generations to know God, specifically the God who met, who made a covenant with Abraham in Genesis, the God who rescued them out of the, uh, the, the Pharaoh's hand in Exodus, the God who gave them a way through the Red Sea on dry ground, a specific God. They also had the prophets that would tell them that from that God was gonna become a savior who was gonna to come to the world and would forgive them of their sins and trespasses and would show them that they could be filled with the Holy Spirit. Specific. He says, we worship what we do know from this lineage, whether it was a, that, that we remember in, in Genesis three, when, the, when Adam and Eve fell into sin, God said that to Eve, you will, your seed is going to crush the head of this serpent, Satan, and he'll just bruise his heel. Uh, God told Abram in Genesis 12 that uh, your seed will be a blessing to the entire world. The whole world will be blessed through you. I'm going to make you a great nation. So the Jews knew what to expect when the Messiah came. He says in verse 23, uh, the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Not in Gerizim or Jerusalem, but in spirit and in truth. Jesus ignores the question of where should we worship and he challenges the woman and says, your worship ought to be real. It ought to be real. It ought to be focused on God. It ought to come from your heart and your mind. Now, I'm not saying those are distinct, but you can't just worship in emotion. It's good if you don't know who you're worshiping, what you're doing. He says, the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Yes, the Father wants people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. He says it two times. In Jewish uh, writing, it's important that something is repeated. It's telling you that it's, that you need to hold on to that, that you need to remember it. So if you if you allow me just to, 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 just to solidify this, this verse for you, I want you to see, when you see worship in the Bible, it's talking about acts of devotion to God, not how I feel when I'm feeling spiritual. Jesus says that true worshipers, people who really are devoted to God and act like it, worship first in spirit. He says God is looking for people who will worship in spirit because God is a spirit. This refers to the fact that God does not have a body. He is a spirit and he uses people like us with an eye on eternity and an inclination towards the invisible. God is looking for people who aren't worried about buildings, who aren't worried about uh, who's doing it right necessarily, but they're more concerned with God being glorified 
Jesus being exalted and people coming to know him in salvation, someone being filled with the Holy Spirit, not the Holy, not the spirit that we see in, in, in these meetings like at Azusa Street that makes you bark like a dog and foam at the mouth. I want you to have the spirit of God inside of you who Paul says in Galatians 5, there's some fruit like love and patience and kindness and gentleness and, and self-control. You got to worship God in spirit. I want someone to know that you got to worship. If you're saying it's for God, God deserves to be worshiped on his own terms. Mm. You got to worship God in spirit. Not about whether you're on Mount Gerizim or, on, or in Jerusalem. Jesus has proven to her that it was now time to worship God face to face and God cared how that happened. Said you guys don't even know what you worship. You got a little bit of this and a little bit of that. A whole lot of uh, uh, consternation and anxiety and, and, and issues with the Jews, but you don't even ultimately know what you're doing it for. So that means, can you see the difference then between what worship is that's confined to a couple hours in a service and then you leave the same way you came. The difference is worship is not what you do in church. Worship truly happens and is proven in how you live the other six days and 22 hours of the week. Who are you when the music is off? Are you still in the spirit? Or do you need that atmosphere to conjure up these ecstatic feelings, emotions, reactions? Because people on the outside know whether you're worshiping in spirit and in truth. Oh, yes, they do. Because I've seen y'all jokers go viral doing the huckabuck and having somebody in a Spider-Man con you know, costume or somebody who's crumping or somebody who's pop-locking and everybody's laughing, telling them to just worship. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't worship with music. You absolutely can. I'm a musician. I'd sound crazy telling you that. Psalm 150 says, hallelujah, praise God in the sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty expanse. Praise him for his powerful acts. Praise him for his abundant greatness. Praise, praise him with the blast of a ram's horn. Praise him with the harp and the lyre. Praise him with the tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and flute and saxophone. Praise him with the resounding symbols. Praise him with the clashing symbols. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Hallelujah. The goal is not to strip away the ways we can express our devotion to God. The goal is to make sure that in every single one of those instances, it says praise him. Praise him. Praise him. Praise him. But you don't have to do it with music. You don't. Jesus says this in uh, Matthew in Matthew chapter 5. You want to talk about how you can show your devotion to God? Check this out. Matthew 5 and 14, he says, You are the light of the world. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand. And it gives you, it gives light for all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to the Father in heaven. Did you know that you could just worship God by the way you walk, the way you talk, the way you love, the way you share, the way you give, the way you live? The way you live ought to be a testimony to God's goodness, to the love that Jesus had for us, to your gratitude that he died for your sins, for your excitement that someone might want to know you. Colossians 3 and 23, Paul says, don't work only while being watched as people pleasers, but wholeheartedly fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do it from the heart as something done for the Lord and not for people, knowing that you will receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord. You serve the Lord Christ. Can you just live like God is who he says he is? Our worship in church or outside of it should be consistent with God's 
spirit. Jesus says that you worship God. He's looking for, he's seeking people to worship him, but they need to be worshiped in, in spirit. Well, what does the Holy Spirit's ministry look like? John 15, 26 says, Jesus tells them, when the counselor comes, the one I will send to you from the Father, the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, mm -hmm. the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. The worshiping in the spirit means that Jesus is being lifted. People who talk about always praising the spirit, moving in the spirit, doing this by the spirit, the spirit falls. The Holy Spirit never testifies of himself. Jesus says it right here. He proceeds from the father. He will testify about me. And you will also testify because you have been with me from the beginning. So if the Spirit is moving in you, the Holy Spirit is working through you, it, he will guide you and lead you to evangelism. In everything that you do, that you will be proclaiming Jesus. He's not coming to preach himself. So if you're in a church, you're following a ministry, you're in a fellowship where all they want to talk about is the Holy Spirit. You might as well be on Azusa Street meeting for eight years and coming every day with the same demons. You're not worshiping according to God's spirit. The, the Holy Spirit is not just a movement. He's not a feeling. He's not an emotion. He's not an atmosphere. He is God who lives on the inside of the heart of every believer. The Holy Spirit goes, comes into church every time a believer walks in. In Ephesians chapter 1, he Paul calls the Holy Spirit the, that we have been entrusted. We've been, we receive the Holy Spirit as an inheritance based on Jesus' death. And he's the down payment that, that we receive from God to know that we know that we know that we are saved and that one day we will be in paradise with him. The proceeds of worship are not just sore feet, being out of breath and your makeup messed up. The proceeds of worship and spirit is that somebody's life is changed because they've heard the good news of Jesus. He says you got to worship in spirit. You also got to worship in truth. Truth means uh, the honesty of mind, which is free from, listen to this, affection, pretense, simulation, falsehood, or deceit. Truth means what I'm doing comes from my understanding. We have to break the habit of having this selfish, I gotta walk to the front before I praise him, see me because I'm nice with it. We gotta break the ourselves from the habit of saying, I, I just gotta, I gotta be me. Y'all gotta see, you can't tell me how to worship. Instead, we ought to seek to be motivated to express our love and devotion to a holy God who while we were yet sinners, his son, Jesus Christ, died for us. Real worship is specific. If the person next to you knows when you're going to hop up and hook a buck, and you can be passed out on the floor because somebody slayed you in the spirit, but then you open one eye and look around to see if it's okay for you to get up. Is that really worshiping in truth? Jesus says, what is that truth? What truth do I have that would guide my worship? Jesus says this in John uh, 14 and 1, don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house, there are many rooms. And if it weren't so, I would have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you. If I go away and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and I'll take you to myself so that where I am, you'll be also. And you know the way. Thomas said, we don't know where you're going. And we don't know the way. And Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you know the Father. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. True worship begins in your heart with your understanding of who Jesus is and what he's done for you. And it ought to manifest in your handiwork, in the way you live your life, the way you support the needy, the way you help people who can't help themselves. True worship has very little to do with what you do in a crowd and everything to do when the spotlight is not on you. 
true worship is something that you understand not just something that you feel ecstatically because i told you that in ephesians that in uh, galatians 5 one of the fruits that is the results of being filled with the spirit is self-control so if you're saying i'm just worshiping and i'm that's either you're not in control and there's some other spirit that is at work or you're worshiping in falsehood because you do that every week Colossians 3 and 15 says let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. We have the greatest truth in the world the truth that the that it's the greatest truth that the world can ever know they call it the gospel the good news that's why you can't afford to be seen hysterical looking like a pagan hindu ritual and then say it was for jesus but didn't bother to look around to see if a sinner came in on his way to a burning hell and did he even get a gospel presentation Worship must be in truth. It's not just see me because I'm nice. Worship is the things that you do that display your devotion to a holy God. Here's how Jesus told the disciples to worship at the end of his earthly ministry. Matthew 28 and 18 says it. He says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. With that in mind, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. And remember, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Jesus tells this woman, you have worship all mixed up. You thought it was about who was right. But neither of you, the Jews rejected Jesus and ultimately had him killed. The Samaritans and the Jews were beefing so much they forgot that God ought to be the center of their worship. So that when, so then the woman, he tells the woman that the father seeks people who are going to worship in spirit and in truth. The woman says to him, I know the Messiah is coming in John 25. 4 and 25, who was called the Christ. And when he comes, he will explain everything to us. Jesus told her, I, who is speaking to you, I am. In Greek, it's ego emi. And he said, I, I am. The same I am who spoke from the burning bush when Moses said, who am I supposed to tell Pharaoh sent me? I don't know how I'm in the presence of God and I'm not dead. It's somehow that you've been, that you've come to the world in a form that allows me to experience you face to face. And he said, tell them I am. Jesus used this title throughout his ministry to show his divinity. He says, I am the Messiah that you're waiting for. I am the truth that you're waiting to receive. I am the way that you're looking for. I am the life that you are in danger of losing. As the disciples rolled up, they, were, they saw that he was talking with this woman, but no one said anything. The woman left her water jar and went to town and told the people, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah, the Mashiach? the Savior, the Christ, the Christos. They left the town and made their way to Jesus. The disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But Jesus said, I have food to eat that you don't know about. The disciples said to one another, could someone have brought him something to eat? Jesus in John 4 and 34 said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me 
and to finish his work, Jesus told them. Don't you say there are still four more months, then comes the harvest? Listen to what I'm telling you. Open your eyes and look at the field because they are ready for harvest. The reaper is already receiving pay and gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and reaper can rejoice together. For in this case, the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. And I sent you to reap what you didn't labor for. Others have labored and have benefited. You benefited from their labor. Jesus said, it's not about water and it's not about food. I have come to offer you eternity and to prepare you to offer that to the next generation. Verse 39 says, and I'm about to get out of here. Now many Samaritans from that town believed in Jesus because of what the woman said when she testified. This woman with a complicated backstory, five husbands in a rearview mirror and living with a boo thing became the first evangelist of Jesus Christ and led a group of Samaritans, people who the Jews took the long way around so they didn't have to look at them. This Gentile nation of confused people. But remember, Jesus told the naysayers when they saw him eating with sinners, I didn't come for the people who think they're well. A physician comes to, to heal the sick. The people said, uh, they came to him and asked him to stay with them. They, he stayed there for two days and many more believed because of the words Jesus said. And they told the woman, we no longer believe because of what you said, since we have heard for ourselves and know that he really is the savior of the world. It was in Samaria, the place that seemed like a lost cause that seemed like the last place where someone could have an experience with God, that Jesus was first recognized publicly as the Messiah and the Savior in his earthly ministry. Listen to Paul in Romans 11, 33. Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And then verse uh, chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of the God's mercy, I, I beg with you, I plead with you, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in light of God's mercy, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will we don't want to ever get so used to a routine that we miss out on the miraculousness of Jesus Christ who came to this world fully God and fully man made some appearances in the Old Testament Isaiah said he was coming, that a virgin would conceive and bear a son, and they would call his name Emmanuel, God with us, and that he, that he would be uh, that he would be born, and the government would be on his shoulder, and he'd be called things like Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And Jesus was born just like he was supposed to, a root who sprang out of the stump of Jesse in the lineage of David, and he came to this world in the form of a little baby born in Bethlehem, fulfilling scripture and prophecy everywhere he went, that all the Old Testament was just priming and pointing us towards Christ Jesus. Everywhere he went, there were people who showed their devotion to him in different ways, not just in song, but also in song. But the proof of their devotion was not in whether they were the loudest or the most ecstatic in their public displays. 
but that they had changed hearts. <laughs> Second Corinthians in five, it says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The proof that you are who you say you are in Christ is does the Holy Spirit truly push you to show someone who Jesus is? I'm sitting here with you right now on Sunday as a show of worship to God. That I understand that the most important decision you ever make in your life is choosing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Recognizing that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and there is always a necessary payment for sin. It separates us from a holy God. It's been like that since Genesis. That we sin because of our pride, our, our, our hate. We sin because, of, because we prioritize ourselves over God. And the ultimate payment for our sins was made on the cross. Jesus lived a perfect life. He never sinned. And he died on the cross in your place, just the way that they had, that God decided it would be from the forgiven, from the beginning of creation, before the foundation of the world. Jesus hung on that cross from noon until 3 p.m. Between two convicted thieves. And he didn't cry out, Lord, this is not fair. He didn't speak in ecstatic tongues. He called out, Lord, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. Still focused, even in that emotion, emotional time, that time of physical anxiety and crushing pain, Jesus still spoke out based on the mission that God had given him. And he gave, he said, he hollered, it's finished. An accounting term that says, paid in full. The account is settled. And he gave up the ghost. Jesus died on that cross. And they buried him in the tomb that they only need a, a, a weekend rent alone. They buried him on Friday and on Sunday morning, the, whole, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, raised Jesus from the dead. And he was seen by hundreds of people who he was happy to show his scars, the marks in his side, his hands and his feet, because it mattered that they knew specifically who they were worshiping. Some people fell at his feet. Other people anointed him with oil and perfume. Some people danced and shouted. But the common thing was that it was not about them, but it was always about Jesus. Don't get caught up. Don't get, don't get discouraged. Don't let anybody shame you into not worshiping the way they do. Don't have anybody make you feel inadequate because as long as what you are doing in church and out of church, I'm not, I get, I, I'm not saying you shouldn't cry. I'm not saying you shouldn't be emotional. I'm saying don't ever turn your mind off and call it worship of the one true God. Because how are you worshiping him in spirit and in truth if you're not even thinking? Where is God being glorified? Do you want to be like Azusa Street? I know a lot of people look back on it and say, what a time we had. And I look back on it to see how many salvation decisions were made. But that never really was the focus. I want you to know that our, our goal at New Mount Zion is to see people transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And you can be saved right now today if you profess true faith in Jesus Christ who died for the forgiveness of your sins. That's what it takes. And I offer you that opportunity today. Simple. I said, I want you to know that you don't have to sit on the fence like the Samaritans, not really sure whether you are worshiping the real God or not, whether you're going to do this all your life and, and, and not know whether you'll be in heaven. I want you to have spirit and truth behind your acts of worship from here on out. To know that you know that you know that when you close your eyes for the last time and draw that last breath like Jesus told that's that uh that man on the cross today you'll be with me in paradise I want you to have that assurance and if you need to make a decision for Jesus come and talk to me in the zoom room the link's in the chat 
if you've never made a decision to live for Jesus, accepting him as your Lord and your Savior, that you've just done church and you want to see how to live for him, today's a great day to do that. And I'd love to help you however I can. I want to talk to you about it because I don't want you to just raise your hand where you are and we thank God and say that we don't want, I don't want to see false conversions in even this emotional moment. I want to make sure that we understand that you understand the decision that you're making. That's the most important thing. Then everything that you do can be based on that. Amen. Maybe you're sitting here thinking, whoo, I need some truth like this. We'd love to have you a member of New Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church. We do have a physical uh, campus. Uh, uh, we have a physical church in Clydeville, Georgia. And we would love to see you there next Sunday. But if you want to join the church, you can click on that same Zoom link. And I'd love to talk to you about I'd like to be your friend. I'd like to help you through. I'd love to be your pastor if you would have me. And introduce you to a family of people you didn't even know you had. In New Mount Zion, where we say that everybody is somebody in Christ Jesus. So uh, that's, your, that's your invitation. That to the end, all of the things that we do so that someone might come to know Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior Amen so let's pray Father thank you thank you for today God um, thank you for this opportunity to stand before your people and proclaim your word Lord thank you for giving us a way to get the message to the people even in technological difficulties Father God I thank you uh, that you have given us so many ways to get to, to, to preach your word Lord we just want to honor you today and worship you Father in spirit and in truth Lord we want to please you with the way that we live. I pray that you would save someone today by the power of your spirit. Draw someone to you. That they would know that they know that they know that their life has been transformed and they never will be the same. They can be born again of the spirit. Today, I pray that you would grow this ministry at the pace and in the way that you want to grow it. Add to our add it to us a number and intensity of worship, service, love, joy, commitment, generosity. Do it how you want to do it, Lord. We submit ourselves humbly at your feet. So, Father, we love you. We thank you. We thank you in advance for what you're about to do, even now in the lives of those who hear your word. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done already what you're doing right now and what you're going to do in Jesus name amen amen listen uh, you can see in the in the link um, in the description here you see the ways that you can support this ministry um, the point is Jesus the way we do it uh, take some take some support so if you want to support us that's the way I'm talking quick because I want to get to the zoom room in case anybody does want to make a decision for Jesus um, we'll be in the sanctuary on next Sunday uh, we're going to pick up where we left off in Ephes yeah, Ephesians chapter 5. Um, so we're going to finish out Ephesians chapter 5 and do a little bit of Ephesians chapter 6 next week. All right, where Paul says, and I like how this all rolls together. Paul says, how do I live for God in wherever I am? And then Paul gives us some examples of what living for Jesus, what worship looks like in practice. I like how this is all coming together. Amen. And uh, on Wednesday, we'll have our uh, online broadcast for Bible study. We'll be live on Facebook and prayerfully on YouTube. And um, we'll be discussing, um, we'll be picking up the book of Malachi. So we can finish the Old Testament minor prophets. And then from Malachi, we're going to roll right into Luke. All right? Luke and then Acts. That's the plan. We'll be, that'll take us a while. So don't you worry. Um, Luke and Acts written by the same author so I think it'd be good for us to go through them and show you from the birth of Jesus to the birth of the church how we got to where we are it's gonna be good so um, if anyone needs anything you need me throughout the week I think my email address is there Pastor Collins nmz at gmail.com please 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 I don't know if you don't tell me what's going on we're here for you we're praying for you we love you there's nothing you can do about it uh, be praying for uh, Elijah and his family in Zambia, they lost, uh, he lost a cousin, a very close family member to him 
uh, this past week, and they'll be burying him tomorrow. So uh, I know that we're not close to you physically, but our hearts are with you, Elijah, and your family. Um, thank you for being so supportive of this ministry, and we pray that God comfort you in, in your time of mourning. Um, if anybody else has anything we need to be praying about, let me know uh, and be listening for. Last thing, we have our meeting, uh, the church business meeting on Saturday, six days from today at 10 a.m. at the church. I'm going to talk about where we are as a, as a ministry, where we want to go. Where do you want to go as a ministry? What are your suggestions? What do you want to volunteer for? What vision has God given you? How is God calling you to worship? So we're going to do that uh, on next Saturday at 10 a.m. at New Mount Zion. All right? And uh, we look forward to seeing you there. Again, thank you for, um, for your flexibility in terms of time and allowing us... Uh, this little extra time. I'm a little over my normal my normal message time, but I think it was necessary. And uh, looking forward to seeing you at church uh, next Sunday, Sunday, Sunday at 11 a.m. at New Mount Zion campus. All right. We love you very much. There's nothing you can do about it. Y'all have a great rest of your day. And uh, I'll get this message posted to YouTube ASAP and get the link out in case anybody prefers to watch on YouTube. Take care of yourselves and each other. Love you. Bye, everybody.